I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University and visiting professor at the Catholic University in Leuven. Uh, and together with my colleague at Leuven, Professor Andrea Robilio, we present to you this course on Thomas Aquinas on Metaphysics. This is Lecture 8b. 8a concerns secondary sources and also the first chapter of the De Ante Descensia. This lecture will be rather lengthy and will be concerned with explicating the basic understanding of De Ante Descensia chapters 2 through 5. So without further ado, let's get underway. So chapter two, essence as found in composite substances. First of all, uh, whether uh, while both form and matter are found in composite substances for Aquinas, such as ourselves, as body and soul, it's incorrect, says Aquinas, to think that either alone is what we mean by essence. The essence, according to Aquinas, is what is the cause of the being of a thing, somehow, and it is what fixes a thing in a certain species or genus and makes the thing knowable. Those of you who have read the valuable article by Professor Hauser uh, may notice then this is the notion of the halkika, or what, what fixes, something in, uh, fixes something in a certain species in some way and gives it a, 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 a firm being here in the account of Avicenna. I can't just go, go through all of the uh, article of Hauser regarding Avicenna, but I'll make a few remarks here and there. Uh, okay, so we carry on then. Uh, it, make, it makes the thing knowable. But matter is not the cause of actuality in a thing and does not make a thing knowable or to be in a certain species or genus, writes Aquinas. What about form alone? Is it essence? Well, it does cause actuality in a thing in a way, and but by essence we mean what is signified through the definition. Okay, essence is what is signified through the definition. And definitions of natural things such as dogs and trees and human beings need to include the matter in addition to the form. An animal is soul and body, not just the soul. And matter is not something additional as, uh, as if it were an accident in some way. Matter, in fact, is part of what it is to be human, because human beings are composites of matter and form, and if this, should be this should be reflected in their very definitions. Matter is not something accidental to the nature of being human. Rather, it is essential to the nature of a human being as a corporeal material composite. Thus, essence should include both matter and form. Moreover, essence is not an additional relation between matter and form because those additional relations are called accidents. We're inquiring here regarding the essential nature of a thing. So, according to Aquinas, form actualizes matter and then the two together uh, in a real composition become one being. This is a real hylomorphic composition. But of course, since matter is potentiality, it receives actual existence or being from the actualizing form. So form is the cause of the actuality of matter. And matter restricts form to an individual. Whatever comes to be then or accrues to the thing after its composition of matter and form which make the composite exist as an actuality, exist, actually existing composite, whatever that is, it must be accidental, that is, it is an accident, and not part of the very essence of a thing. So accidents will have their own essences, an essence that is dependent upon substance, but here in the case of, of a composite substance, then an accident is not included in the very essence of, of the thing. It may be consequent upon the essence, but it's not included in the very essence. So an, ac an accidental coming into being is, quote, qualified coming into being, says Aquinas, or coming to, into being in a certain respect, not an absolute coming into being. So this is his, his, his rendering of the notion of Aristotle with regard to accidental change. Thus, uh, essence must be of the composite of matter and form. And Aquinas notes, Boethius agreed to this when he said that ousia, most translations, this comes through as substantia or substance, from the Greek into Latin. Ousia signifies a composite thing. And Avicenna had said, 
quiddity, uh, see earlier our discussion earlier, uh, uh, quiddity agrees too in this. This is quite reasonable because the composite substances really do have a composite being or existence. Their very being or existence consists in their being composites or composite substances uh, as what they are. And the essence is the essence of the thing, not a part. Remember, a thing is called an essence because it is first called a being, as we saw in the previous video regarding uh, ch chapter 1. Uh, paragraph 4, then, of uh, chapter 2. Now, since matter seems to be the principle of individuation in a thing, it might seem, then, that essence only concerns particulars and is not about some sort of universal that is knowable. And if essence is what is signified by the definition, then universals, on this, in this case, universals then couldn't have definitions or be defined if essence only concerns particulars. However, the matter that individuates is not just any matter, but rather designate matter or signate matter, matter that is, that is designated under certain determinate conditions and, de and dimensions. We, uh, we do something else when we consider definitions. Then we use the notion of undesignated matter or undetermined or indeterminate matter to fill in where we would otherwise indicate the matter of some determined thing. So a, defin so a definition is, is indefinite. It's not a definition, they're not definitions of individuals, uh, but rather defini definitions of things which fall into species. So in the definition of the universal man or human being, we say that human being has in its definition bones and flesh because they're essential parts of the definition of what it is to be a human being. But we don't specify whose bones or flesh in this case. They're not in the definition as such. The def that's in the definition of the universal where indeterminate matter is indicated. Signate matter or designated matter is what delimits this delimits the essence to a particular thing or a particular being. So in this case we're talking in the case of a definition of a universal we're talking about bones and flesh considered in an indeterminate way. So the essence of Socrates is the essence of this particular human being whose form and matter are determinately designated and which make up that composite being whose name is Socrates. And these same notions of designated and undesignated also apply to notions of the essence of the genus and the essence of the species as well. So matter as a result, matter designates the individual with respect to species and the species is designated by the difference with respect to genus. The difference delimits, delimits the genus and through the difference the species is designated. Now, regarding the latter, as with respect to genus, we mean that a human being uh, is designated by his, by his rationality with respect to the genus animal, which contains many other sorts of animals. So again, as we've seen, as, and as he promised, he's explaining the different notions of uh, and conceptions of genus and species and essence and being and much more. It's very important to get these clear for Aquinas, very important so that the arguments can uh, can progress and so that his brothers can understand, his brother Dominicans, can better understand the philosophical notions involved, which is what the purpose of this text is. Remember, he, he did uh, write this text at a time when he's writing his commentary in the sentences. So he was asked to make write this, and so he took a break, as it were, from his commentary in the sentences to explain in this short treatise uh, a number of key terms. And also, I think, to set out the metaphysical framework for much of his later thinking and to set it out on, on a dialectical basis. Dialectical in the sense that through putting together these notions then he reaches a satisfactory account, uh, a satisfactory metaphysical account according to his own views. But nevertheless the starting points are dialectical and the value of the dialectical starting points will be shown later on through the arguments explanatory value. But we go on. This is, uh, this is uh, paragraph 6 of chapter 2. 
Consider this further for clarity's sake because we want to have a clear understanding of how the genus implicitly contains a species in an indeterminate way. It can still be understood alone as prescinding from any other perfection. Now let me be, sh be clear about what prescinding involves here. To prescind from something is to, is to leave something out. So we apply a concept, but we prescind from its application to individual human beings, perhaps. And so to prescind is to, to leave something aside, not to take everything that's involved into account. Body, in this case, is equivocal, since it has many meanings. Body can mean a part of an animal, or it can also mean a genus, which is quite different from the integral part of a thing. So A, the term body can be used to designate a thing which has form that determines it with regard to three dimensions, prescending from, again, absolutely excluding consideration of anything else which might further determine or perfect it. So in a general way, then, body can be used to designate a thing which possesses form determining it to have three dimensions. Considered in this way, body is that which soul is joined to in order to make up a living being composed of body and soul as two parts. So it's under the consideration of it. And notice I say considered in this way, because we're talking about modes of consideration here, ways of abstraction, and different conceptualizations that are going on. And Aquinas needs to get these very clear as he presents his understanding to his brothers. Seventh, then B, but body can also be taken as the genus in the sense of anything having three dimensions regardless of what form it may have. In this case, body is not a part. We can say that some body here is a, we can say that body here is a genus for animal. Body is the genus under which an animal is placed. In this sense, animal contains nothing that is not already contained within the notion of body. Now, the relationship of a human being to animal is similar. The notion or genus animal implicitly, or one might say indeterminately, contains human being as one of its possible determinations. So it's implicitly contained already in the, gen in the generic notion of body that a human being is the possibility of it being determined to a human being, being the genus of a human being, is, is there. And so too with regard to animal then, there are many animals and the possibility of a human being being determined to the, in the genus of animal. It's implicitly contained uh, within the genus. So the genus signifies in an indeterminate way everything that is in the species but the genus can be narrowed down further. So we can talk about living things, the genus of living things, and there can be living things that move themselves, living things that do not move themselves. We're talking about plants and animals, but they are all implicitly or indeterminately contained within the generic notion of body. And the difference then designates the whole thing, not the form alone. So the, the, the specific difference that puts something in a species designates the whole thing and not just the form, because it delimits the genus. So rationality belongs to a human being as a whole being who is a unity. Rationality does not belong just to the form, but to the whole being. And as we've seen, the definition signifies the whole, too. So in this sense, body and soul must be, must be viewed as two parts making up uh, a whole human being. And the genus signifies what awaits determination, and that determination takes place through the specific form of something. So it's delimited by the form. Now, genus is like matter, Aquinas notes, but it is not matter. All right, so it's an equivocal notion. Uh, we can say it's like matter, so it's matter-like, so we can call genus in a way, we can call genus matter for, as potency for restrictive determination by form. And form is like difference, but form is not difference. Uh, I'm sorry, a, form is, a difference is like form, but it is not form. 
So if we bring together the genus and the specific difference, then we have the determination of the actualization of something in, in, its, in its logical genus. Human being, uh, the rational animal, is not two parts, rational and animal, as a composite. Those are abstract notions and not realities as parts. Okay, so notice then, this is what his, his purpose is here, to explain different divisions, terminology, forms of abstraction. It's extremely important to understand what he's doing here then, because he's talking about the abstract notions of rational and animal, but they are not realities in themselves, but rather abstract notions formed in the mind. They have grounds in the world, but they're abstract notions and separated off and treated in this fashion as if they were parts of a human being, but they're not. So the human body and soul, the human, the human is body and soul as parts of which human being is composed. Of course, human is neither alone nor because uh, human is the result of the composition of the composing, a result which does not exist before the actual composing. It's then a third thing which uh, with neither uh, of its, uh, identical with neither of its parts. So when, uh, when body and soul come together, they don't remain two parts, but they become a third thing in a true hylomorphic composition. And a, con a contemporary um, modern example would be uh, the notion that oxygen and hydrogen uh, are not, uh, as it were, parts of water, but they go into the composition of water. They make a true hylomorphic composition in a third thing. Of course, that third thing can be broken down into its internal internal. Uh, internal parts, such as oxygen and hydrogen, both of which are very flammable, but water itself is not flammable. So water, water itself is a third thing. That's the kind of thing that Aquinas is talking about here. Now, essence is not the genus alone, because otherwise it would have the, we would have the same very essence as a dog. So essence requires then the difference or indetermination of the genus be delimited by the difference to make the species of which there is an essence. So, as I said earlier, uh, the genus has to be delimited in this way. As the genus indifferently and indeterminately signifies all the many species of things, that is, all animal indeterminately signifies man, dog, bird, etc. Uh, animal does so as such, as genus. So, to the species indeterminately signifies all the individuals. So all these human beings, Dana, Anthony, Jordan, Chris, etc., uh, human being, or man, indeterminately signifies all of these in an indeterminate way, in a general way. So it's a concept as such, and these are included under that concept. Now humanity then designates the what it is to be a, a human being. It designates what makes a human being to be such. But when we talk about humanity, it prescinds from or excludes designated matter. So we don't say John is humanity because something is left out there. John has designated matter. This designated matter is necessary in a real human being, but humanity, we say, he shares in some way. So humanity in this sense signifies the form of the whole man, including both form and matter, but the way it does so is through prescinding from or excluding from consideration the factors which enable matter to be designated. As when we, when we consider this man, John, whose matter is designated here and now, that is particularized, determinate, and designated matter at this time, in this place, as a particular. The essence of a human being, then, can be signified in two different ways. Man, or human being, expresses it as a whole, not prescinding from designated matter. So we can use it that way, not prescinding from designated matter, not leaving designated matter out, but implicitly in an in, and in an indistinct way, containing all that is human in individuals having designated matter. So in this way, it can be said or predicated of individuals such as Barbara or Connor. We can predicate human beings. So that's one way we can predicate it. But humanity 
is not the same because it prescinds from all designation of matter. So humanity cannot be predicated of individual human beings. We don't say that Barbara is humanity. We don't predicate humanity of Barbara in that way. For this reason, we can, we can say Socrates is an essence, meaning he is a human being. And we can also say that the essence of Socrates is not Socrates, with the meaning in this case that humanity is not Socrates. Chapter 3. The relationship of essence to genus, species, and difference. So, what is the status of essence with respect to genus, species, and difference? Clearly, Aquinas wants to be wants to be very straightforward and clear about the terms that he's using here and explain the relationship of these notions, which are key metaphysical considerations as well, in the natures of things uh, and in the way the mind conceives things. So genus, species, and difference are, uh, as universal, are attributed to some individual determinate thing. So humanity and animality, which signify only a part, not the whole individual determinate thing, don't have the notion of universal. So the notion of universal must also contain then the reference to both the form and the matter of the thing. Uh, as Avicenna points out, uh, these and also rationality are principles of the species, genus, and difference, but not themselves the species, genus, and difference. Furthermore, we can't attribute the notions of genus and species to some sort of essence existing as a reality outside the individual things, as Plato seemed to have done, because these notions of genus and species could not be attributed to the individual. We really can't say that Paul is a, is a human uh, or an animal, and that human and animal exist only separately outside him. He would then be separate from himself. And as Aristotle said in Book One of his Metaphysics, if we only knew separate platonic forms, we couldn't know things of this world. The in, that is, we couldn't know the individuals in our world, the individuals of sense experience. And uh, you can also see how Plato similarly criticized his own doctrine of the divided line in the dialogue Parmenides. This is the notion yeah, used there uh, that of, the, of uh, separate, uh, separate forms and forms in the world, and that there would be no communication between them. But I leave it to you to look at Plato's dialogue, the, Par the Parmenides, for this. So, genus and species just don't apply to essence where essence is expressed as a part. Essence expressed as a whole, for example, man or human being, animal, contains implicitly, in an indistinct way, in an indeterminate way, everything that is in the individual. But these are under logical considerations. So a nature of an essence can be considered in two different ways. Now we'll look at the nature of the essence. And the nature of the essence can be considered in two different ways. And this is something that Aquinas takes from Avicenna as well as uh, Hauser points out, and is also obvious to you, I think, as a result of some of the things we've already seen in Avicenna. Essence absolutely considered. This is a notion taken from Avicenna that the, that the essence of a thing can be considered in itself, or it can be considered in the two ways that can be instantiated, in the human mind or in the world. But Avicenna set forth the notion that it can also be considered in another way. Essence absolutely considered. Here, for Aquinas, we consider the essence only in and of itself. We consider just what belongs to it alone without reference to anything else outside of itself. So just the essence. For example, how it belongs to human, uh, how uh, to man belong rational animal, rational animal, and any other necessary definitional characteristics, but a human being absolutely considered does not have to be white or black to be a human being. You can have these, just these considerations, but we're after this essence absolutely considered in this case. So now consider the question of whether this essence considered absolutely must be one or many. 
if the essence in itself, uh, considered absolutely, is many, that is, it's a plurality, it could never be one. But of course, we know it's one in Timothy. What if it were just one, in and of itself, in its very essence? What if essence itself were essentially, in its very nature, one? Then Tracy and Carlos could not be individuals, individual human beings. Because if, if, the, if the human essence is there, then the two are necessarily one because of the nature of the essence is to be one. They would have to be one essence. What then shall we say? Well, essence absolutely considered is neither one nor many, for Aquinas, following Avicenna. And again, I mentioned the Platonic problems uh, as discussed in Plato's Parmenides. Uh, paragraph three. Uh, second, then, nat nature or essence can be considered according to the being it has in the individual. So in the one case, the first case, we have abs essence absolutely considered. And then we can have essence considered as in the individual, but it will be in the individual mind or in the individual in the world. So let's look more closely. These are, this nature essence then has two, a twofold being. This nature uh, has a twofold being in its manifestation in things, and that is in individual things and then also in the mind. The fact that the same essence can be in things of the world and also in the mind, of course, makes cognition possible for human beings. So A, in individuals, we see nature or essence existing in, in, in a multiple way corresponding to many different individuals, such as individual human beings. No individual has the essence of what it is to be human absolutely considered. Rather, each has the essence of human being as manifested in one individual existing being. If the essence of a human being were to belong to Jacob, then none of us could be human by essence. But of course, the essence of a human being must be able to exist in individuals, since otherwise no individual would have essence. So the essence of a human being, absolutely considered, is abstracted or separated from every kind of being, quote, but in such a way that it prescinds from no one of them, close quote. All right, so when you talk about the essence considered in an absolute fashion, it has been abstracted without precision. That is, it still implicitly allows reference to human beings. If we abstract the essence of human being, it still implicitly allows that. It prescinds or cuts off from none of them. But then if we consider but considered in itself, then essence absolutely considered is also not a universal. Because the essence considered in this way does not have the unity and community, the oneness and commonness, included in our proper notion of a universal. So B, what about essence in the soul or the mind, or more precisely in the intellect? Here, essence can be universal. This is where the notions of species and genus as universal are found. So what we do is, the, is an abstraction from all individuating factors, and we form in our minds a universal notion which applies to all humans existing outside our minds. This is a likeness of all that leads to knowledge, uh, a likeness of all that leads to knowledge of all insofar as they are humans, not insofar as they are individuals. So through the abstraction of the essence in this way, we're able to have knowledge, but we have the essence in our minds now as an accident of the human intellect. The notion of species then is formed because of the general relation of the mind to things outside because the mind finds this likeness and attributes to it the nature. But both Averroes and Avicenna agree that the intellect causes the universality in things. So the universal doesn't exist out there as such, but rather things exist and the mind is able to put them under consideration as universals by apprehending the essence that is common to all the members of the species. 
But of course, the universality comes from the relation of the form, as I just said, to the things uh, as the likeness of those things. And it doesn't come because of some one common, universal, all-encompassing, separate intellect or mind, as Avera was taught in the long commentary in the De Anima, something I've mentioned briefly before. I'd be glad to talk to talk with you about it again in class. Avera was held briefly in brief. Avera was held that because of because of his somehow uh, realistic conception of in intelligibles in act, which was based on the idea uh, of Themistius, that it is necessary that there be one intellect for all humankind for the sake of common discourse and thought, in such a way that the universals are all in one mind or intellect, the separate material intellect. So all for, according to Themistius, all our common concepts that we have that we use again and again in discourse, in order for us to have the same referent for these, there must then be a thesaurus or treasury of reference, and these will then be the universals. And, and according to Themistius, then, these have to have a certain reality outside the individual. And Averroes doesn't want to admit the reality outside the individual, but he will say that they have to have a certain reality in the separate material intellect which human beings share. But again, if you want to talk about Averroes at some length, uh, I'd be delighted to do so. I'd make an appointment to see me during my office hours. Uh, paragraph 8. Then the notion of species is extrinsic or accidental to the essence absolutely considered. In the mind, the essence can be considered as a species, but the essence itself is not necessarily universal. Otherwise, we'd have to say that Daniel is a species, which is not correct. So that would happen if the notion of species were part of the very notion of the essence, even when the essence is absolutely considered. We want to say that Daniel possesses everything which belongs to a human or as a human. But the notion of essence absolutely considered saves us from this problem. How then are uh, essence and species related? Species and universality generally belong to the essence as it is considered by the intellect. That is, be, quote, because of the being it has in the intellect, close quote. Because of this, notions of genus and difference also belong to the essence. But it's because of the being that it has in the intellect. But of course, in particular things, the essence has being in the individual. And when we perceive those individuals as individuals, I see Tom, for example, then it's a it is a kind of cognitional being that Tom has in my cognition over and above the being that Tom has out there in the world on his own regardless of my perceptions. Chapter 4, perhaps the most important uh, in the work. Uh, chapter 4, Essence as Found in Separate Substances. Paragraph 1. Now, let's have a look at how essence can exist in separate substances, by which is meant the human soul, the intelligences, according to the philosophers, or the angels, according to Aquinas, and the first cause, that is, God. Now, everyone admits that the first cause, or God, is simple in nature without any composition in any way whatsoever. Notice the dialectical approach. Everyone admits. We're not going to prove this now. Everyone admits this. But beyond that, there's a great deal of disagreement about the natures of intelligences and human souls, and some people even saying that, in a way, all things except God have some kind of matter. In this context, he's referring to Ibn Gabiril explicitly, but of course his more obvious target is St. Bonaventure, whose uh, commentary on the sentences Aquinas had been reading, and uh, St. Bonaventure who holds that there is such a thing as a spiritual matter. And he uses this in a way to account for ontological contingency. But Aquinas rejects this completely. So separate intelligences or substances are immaterial. And here's a proof from the power of understanding for Aquinas. Forms are actually intelligible only when separate from matter and its conditions. But this actual intelligibility comes only when they are received into a mind 
by a power belonging to an intelligent substance which receives them and acts on them. Therefore, every intellectual substance has to be free of matter to receive forms in this intellectual way. If it had matter, then things would be delimited in a way, but for actual intelligibility, they have to be received into something which is able to receive and act upon them without their being determined by matter. This goes back to Aristotle's discussion in De Anima, book, book 3, chapter 4, about the openness of the mind to all things that are. And so the mind has to be open to things in order to receive them in, in intelligibility. So it isn't just a kind of corporeal matter that might prevent intelligibility of a form, because corporeal matter is just matter having a corporeal form. And this corporeal form, like any form, is actually intelligible insofar as it is abstracted from matter. So even the notion of things having a corporeal form is a notion that's abstracted from, from matter. Therefore, says Aquinas, human souls and intelligences or angels don't have in themselves the composition of matter and form although they do have the composition of form and being, in this case, essay. Of course, we've already seen that in the Liber de Causis, where the Liber de Causis says the intelligences and souls and, and things other than God are composites of, uh, of form and being. And also that God is ania fakot, or the Latin translation of that, Esse Tantum, which Aquinas uses here again. But we'll see that shortly. So how can this be? If one thing is a cause of the being of another, then the first can exist without the second, writes Aquinas, although not vice versa. Form gives being to matter, as we've already seen in Aristotle, so matter cannot exist without form, although it's quite conceivable that form can exist without matter. So we might say that forms without matter are in some sense closer to God who is most simple and who is pure act. And these forms or beings close to God are called intelligences or angels. And Aquinas says there's no necessity that their essences be anything else but form alone. So these are pure forms. But nevertheless, they're going to be, have a, comp a composition here. The essence of a composite substance then in contrast, has form and matter, while the essence of a simple substance has form alone. So, A, the essence of a composite can be signified as part or whole, while the essence of a simple substance can be signified only as a whole, because it is only form. So we have to signify the whole thing. The essence is signified as a whole thing, which is just form. We don't other things are signified as having matter and form, but uh, and so they can be signified in part or as a whole. But here, it's only since there is no matter involved in the separate simple substances, then they can be only considered as form because they are pure forms and intellectual as such. And B, essences of composites are multiplied, but entities such as angels or intelligences, which have no matter at all cannot be multiplied as individuals within a species. That is, in their case, there are as many species as individuals. We might say angels and intelligences differ in species the way dogs and cats differ in species, although for the angels, this is in their individual natures. So they're quite different. Each one is a distinct species unto itself. But of course, these are pure forms. Uh, these pure forms are not absolutely simple because uh, they are not absolutely and purely just the act of being, but rather they have some potentiality or potency. Of course, pot potentiality and potency are usually said with regard to matter, but in this way, the must, these must have some potentiality and potency because they are not purely simple. Consider essence. Anything not contained in, its uh, in it is extrinsic in the sense that it comes from outside the notion. But the essence can be understood without knowing how the essence exists, how it has being, or knowing anything about its being. So you can understand the essence of something without necessarily knowing 
that it exists. So being is other than essence or quiddity, unless somehow there is a being whose essence is its being. So what is Aquinas doing here? He's making at least a conceptual distinction between the being of the thing and the essence of the thing. And so it will be that way for all such essences unless there is one whose essence is its being. And of course that would be God. Such a thing then will be unique, of course. It will have no difference, matter, or distinction between receiver and received. It will be a subsistent being, being itself, ipsum esse, without any addition of form. So it will be pure being as pure active existing. And of course, this is Avicennian. It would also be wujud uh, mutlak, a kind of absolute existence in some way. And certainly it would be wujud, uh, the wajibal wujud, the necessary of existence or the necessary being for Avicenna as well, which is subsistent being. All else would be either form and being, or form and matter and being. So it alone would be pure being, that is, pure active being or pure active existence. So this, uh, this essay or being comes from, outs, uh, from outside the essence and is what makes the essence actually exist in the case of everything other than God. And everything which is such that its being is distinct from its nature or essence must get the, its being from another source. So this is what the essence existence distinction does, and it allows one to, to make these assertions if one accepts that there is this primary instance, which is pure being, because it must be distinguished from all other things. So that other source, in the case of something that comes into being, or has being from outside itself, that other source must be what causes being for all other entities. It must not merely have being as part of something, but rather it must itself be pure being, which is not restricted or delimited by any form. It must be God, the absolutely first cause of all. And in this case also, the being that it produces cannot be identical with its own being, so it must produce being by an efficient causality. Or it seems to be required here at any rate. So every receiver is potential with respect to what it can receive, and what is received in it is its actuality. This is, the, this is the principle taken from physics, but now we're going to apply this to metaphysics because we agree, or we will shortly agree, that God is that being which is pure being. On the basis of that, we argue that everything then has a distinction of essence and existence in it on the basis of the assumption of the divine simplicity and the divine nature as pure being or esse tantum. So in this case then, it receives something and uh, what is received in it is its actuality. And the actuality of being will be involved here. Similarly then, the radio receiver is able to receive the transmission from the radio station that is potential with respect to what it can receive. And the transmission received in it uh, is the actuality or actualization of the radio uh, as what is what it is in act uh, or when fully working, namely a radio receiver. So the essence then, as quiddity or form in the, in the intelligence of the angel, must be playing the role of potency to receive being or active existence from God who causes it actually to exist. This does not mean that it's pre-existing, but rather in the ontological analysis of it, then we see that since, es since being is not contained within its essence, it must receive being and be a composite of being in essence itself, and it must receive being from outside of itself. And the only one who can provide that being is God. So there's a sense in which there is a potency and a certain act in intelligences, but this is not the same potency as we find in, uh, in matter. There's a kind of receptivity, but now we're moving on the metaphysical level, not the natural level, and not the level of motion as such. But if you feel that you must use the terms matter and form to describe these, that may be possible, says for Aquinas, but you have to realize that you're using these terms wrongly, or at least not properly. That is to say, you're equivocating. 
because you're using the term matter to indicate some kind of contingency, especially when, uh, especially in the case of those who put forward this notion of matter uh, as a metaphysical principle, which we find in Bonaventura uh, and others, uh, the Franciscan tradition in particular. Uh, but Aquinas thought this was just bad philosophy. But uh, tip, as, tip, as is typical, Aquinas prefers here to blame even Gabriel or Wenzelbrunn rather than uh, from the Franciscan Bonaventure. I should add, too, that this notion of celestial matter, or rather matter in the angels, uh, is, is something that Bonaventure found in Augustine, and indeed it is found in, in Augustine as such. It's not fully developed in Augustine, but it's found in Augustine and developed much further by Bonaventure. So these various notions of suffering, receiving, being in a subject in some way are expressions which seem to be attributed to things because of matter, but now Aquinas is allowing us to use them in an extended sense in order to discuss intellectual substances, in the sense that intellectual substances, although immaterial, are still in, uh, in a situation of receptivity with regard to the very existence they have because they are not existence itself. And only existence itself is not in a position of receptivity to receive existence from another. So when you do that, you're equivocating. But we know this, so it's not, it, it's not as uh, drastic. It's not uh, trickery of some kind, but it's an equivocal sense of this. And it's equivocal because we're not using exactly the same meaning when it's used of intellectual substances when also used of corporeal bodily substances, that is bodily substances. So analogy and, or equivocation is certainly permissible with careful use as long as one knows exactly what one is speaking about and how the words are used in the different senses. So this is an extended metaphysical sense of, of a receptivity found of, uh, by analogy with what takes place in physics. We must remember, though, that we said that, the, that an intelligence or angel is pure form without matter so it is an essence which is only form, and this is the whole or complete answer to the question, what is it? So it's just form. While that form or quiddity, or the whatness or essence, is identical with that which it is, so that its very self is its essence, it's, an ident it's identical there, it, it does not have matter, so its essence is, is the, uh, the form or quiddity of the thing, Still, says Aquinas, it needs being, which is that by which it subsists in reality. And this being is received from God, as I said. So we could say with some people that, that a substance such as an intelligence is composed of that by which it is, or that which is. This is Boethian language, of course. Uh, and we could say, uh, uh, or similarly follow uh, Boethius, uh, that composed of that which is, or at being, again, Boethian language. But there are other interpretations of this as well. Now, Averroes indicates himself, in fact, that there is a sense of potency required in all but one of the immaterial substances. And I'll be glad to talk with you about this if you're interested. Uh, accordingly, then, these separate substances are distinguished uh, from one another by degrees of potency and act. This Aquinas has in mind of various discussions of, in his commentary on Book Lambda, where he talks about a hierarchy and a potency, potency among the separate, uh, the separate intelligences. And this is where this is what Aquinas has in mind with regard to this. He's, he's looked at. We know he's looked at this uh, material very, very closely uh, because of his work in the commentary and the sentences. So at the same time as, as he's writing the De Ante, he's he has his eye also on. The commentary in Book Lambda, or Book 12, of the Metaphysics of Aristotle by Averroes. So the separate substances are distinguished from one another by degrees of act and potency. Those closer to God, who is, who is pure act, uh, themselves have more act and less potency than those distinct from God, uh, more distant from God, pardon me. So there's a hierarchy. Now, among the separate substances, then, he says, the human soul is indeed an intellectual substance, but it has the lowest place on the hierarchy of substances. So low that in fact, in order to fulfill itself, it must make use of the body and the senses of the body to know things. And its primary object of its knowing are things of the world. So what is the nature of the human soul as an intellectual substance? 
Aristotle says in his De Anima that the possible intellect, uh, uh, the possible intellect, which is where the intelligible forms or intelligible structures of things are received, when we know this possible intellect is open to all reality and is like a blank tablet on which nothing has yet been received, a tablet ready to receive any intelligible form. This is De Anima 3.4. Yet the human soul is so low in the hierarchy that it shares its being such that the soul and body make one being in a composite substance. So while the soul has an intellectual substance in its own right, the human soul is so far down on the, uh, on the hierarchy of being that it must be composed with the body. Here the soul does not depend on the body for its being, but it depends on the body for its knowing because it uses the tools of the body. Rather, the body depends on the soul with regard to the communication of being to the body. So, as long as the soul is united to the body, then the body has being. So, first being belongs to the soul, and then it is shared with the body. So, so closely are they united that the soul uses the senses of the body as the soul works to fulfill itself in knowing, as I said earlier. After the human, human soul and body, there are other forms as well. But unlike human soul, which is the form of the human body, and which can exist apart from the body, lower forms cannot exist without matter. So the dog, the cat, the squirrel, these cannot exist without matter. These are forms which are, have their, these are uh, essences which have their very being in matter. There's nothing to indicate that in fact they may have being separate, as there is something to indicate in the case of human beings, that is intellectual understanding indicates that human beings have something more than just uh, bodily reality. Chapter 5, uh, Essence as Found in Different Beings. To, re to recapitulate then, there are three ways that substances can have essence. Where A, essence is perfectly identical with being, I say your existence, and that's God. B essence is distinct from being, uh, at, from uh, is distinct from being, as we find in the case of intellectual substances, which are divided into two kinds: angels, which never have any contact with matter, and human souls, which at least for some time are in touch with matter by being in a body. And C there are essences such that they are distinct, uh, such that things that, that have essence such that it is distinct from uh, being, but the essence is necessarily always part of the composite of matter and form, and can never exist apart. Again, my reference, lions, tigers, dogs, cats, water, etc. These are all perishable things. So A, God, we can say, is a reality whose essence is his very being. In a sense, then, God does not have quiddity or essence, because his essence is God's being, the very same thing. And if God has no quiddity or essence, God has no limiting form to make God finite and to place God in some genus. So God is not any in any genus. God is pure being only, says Aquinas, as esse tantum. Does this mean that God is the being of things? Aquinas rejects this immediately. The things, uh, are all things parts or accidents belonging to the one being of God? No. Someone under the influence of Parmenides might think this, uh, uh, because outside of being, nothing is. But to be outside of being really is not to be part of being. And so God is not to be identified with esse commune or ens commune, the common being that all things have, and virtue of which they're distinguished from God. So there's not a God is not a kind of universal being, in which uh, all things subsist some way, uh, and not and do not really have their being. Rather, uh, they exist as additions or modifications of divine being in some way. No, this is not at all what Aquinas has in mind. If God is not a universal form of all things. Rather, God is separated from creation insofar as God is the efficient cause of, create, of created things. Universal being, rather, is a, is a conception of the mind, as are all universals. 
what exists are beings which are different from one another because each has its own being, each has its own individual substance or being. And God, God is pure being without any addition. And as pure, God, uh, it, is ra it is being radically distinct from all other sorts of things, all other sorts of being, and in its own purity, it is individuated. And where does Aquinas get that? That's from chapter 8 of the Libra de Causis. I think we talked about this a bit in class. That last, that last chapter, uh, it's, it, uh, raised the, the author raises the question, well, uh, if you insist that it must have an individual nature of its own, I say it is the, it is the pure good, and, and, uh, and it's the pure being, etc. So it's individuated by its own purity, and that's exactly what Aquinas is referring to here. The conception of universal then does not make sense as an abstraction of the mind. That is of universal. I'm, I'm sorry. The conception of universal being does make sense as an abstraction of the mind, only as an abstraction of the mind. But it does not, uh, as such, it does not prescind from or leave out an addition in which reality determines it as being in a particular. So the notion of common being includes all of the beings underneath it without prescinding from any of them. But it's an abstraction that, it, that prescinds from, it's an abstraction of the mind that prescinds from the consideration of all the individuals, although they're implicitly included. This universal being must be a notion that indeterminately and indefinitely does contain all the additions that can be made to it in specifying the kinds of beings. Why? What would happen if this universal being were a notion of being which prescinded from all additions, which in no way included any additions to determine it? What would be the status of the additions? Are they beings? If this notion prescinded from addition, we could not conceive anything existing in which there would be an addition to being. All things, that is, would be one. And I already mentioned this, this uh, remark about ens commune and, and esse uh, commune as well. So divine being of God is different because it is absolutely unlimited and all-perfect, pure being, without any addition possible. Paragraph 3 then, of, five, of chapter 5. So God is pure being, but in the sense that he possesses all perfections manifested in all creatures. We've seen this in Al-Farabi, we've seen it in Avicenna already. Although in creatures those perfections are manifested in a lesser way, uh, uh, in him in a much more excellent and exalted way. It's almost the language we saw in Al-Farabi's On the Perfect State, and we can see in Avicenna as well. In other things, perfections are manifested in diverse ways, but in God they are all perfectly united in his one simple being, which is identical to his essence. It's Avicenna. In that being are found all the perfections that can be had by creatures, and more, of course, although in God they exist in a much more exalted way, which our human reason cannot fully grasp or even express in language. B. In created intellectual substance, essence is found as distinct from being. In these substances, then, separate from matter, being is, is received in the way we said and is limited and restricted in accordance with the essence of the receiver. That is, it is, quote, restricted to the capacity of the recipient nature. And each of the natures is in a hierarchy, right, because if they were at the same level, they would be identical with one another, because each is a species unto itself. And each is an essence that receives being, even though they are immaterial. So these intelligences or angels, which are always separate from matter, uh, in this case, this means that their forms limit the being they receive from a higher reality God. But they are not limited from, uh, limited from below, as they would be if they had matter. These intelligences then, are, each of them is a separate species unto themselves because they don't have matter. Now what's the status of the human soul? And how does it get its own individuality? And how is it that it doesn't lose individual being when it's separated from the body? And be absorbed, as it were, back into one great being in some way. That's not at all how Aquinas conceives this, though. 
Since humans are composite entities, they have in their very existence in their composition. Soul is the life source for, for the body, and the two together make one living human person. The human person, that is soul, soul and, and body together make one person. The person acquires his individuality at the moment of his coming into existence as a real composite being which exists as a unity of soul and body. And that's what Avicenna says as well. But the soul is an intellectual substance which indicates that it does not need the body for all its operations. In fact, we've seen the soul is the form and the form communicates actual existence or being to the body when the two are one composite thing. If that's so, then after the soul and body have been made to exist as one composite, actually existing being, it still remains that the soul, uh, for the soul to exist without the body. The possibility is there. So Tim is one composite of, of soul and body, but since part of him, namely the soul, seems to be intellectual and separable from the body, because the operations it can perform without a body, and since it is conceivable that the soul has a separate being, once the soul has acquired its individual being by having been made the form of this particular body, then that being always remains individuated. It does not lose its individuation once it receives individuation, or once it is individuated in a particular body, it is the particular existing thing in this body, and it does not lose that particular existence or being. It remains with it, and the soul itself is immaterial as well. As Avicenna said, it's a rational soul, not necessarily immaterial. Aquinas does something similar here, too. Furthermore, substances whose quiddities are not identical with their beings can be classified in categories, so genus, species, and difference apply to them. I know it's not possible for us to know absolutely and perfectly the essential differences of sensible things, according to Aquinas, but we can get some grasp of what they are through the accidents they cause. But in the case of immaterial substances, we don't have a clue. We do not have their proper accidents, and so we can't understand their real differences or even accidental differences, says Aquinas. Genus and difference are derived, then, in different ways in sensible substances and immaterial substances. In the immaterial substances, which are simple essences or simple quiddities, the difference is taken from the whole essence or quiddity. As we've already seen, this is just summarizing. In sensibles, what is called a simple difference can be taken from the form, but that form is only part of the quiddity or essence. And that's why we use the term simple difference. What about genus? What about the genus of immaterial substances? Separate substances are alike in being immaterial and they differ in degree of perfection. So then we might derive the genus from what follows as a result of their immateriality, namely their intellectual characters. So we might have a general notion of a genus of some fashion or another, and the difference, the difference which is derived from what follows upon the degrees of perfection, though, that's something we don't know. It remains unknown to us. So we don't have a proper difference in understanding them. We just don't have exact access to that knowledge. So in these things which are separate forms, different degrees of perfection in their forms produce necessarily different species. And C, then, essence in, in things of this world. Essence in things whose very existence is always had as composites of matter and form, such as lions, tigers, bears, fish, worms, and many other things, also involves the reception and limitation of being, which they receive from another source, namely God. But in this case, a plurality of individuals is brought about by the matter, and also their very being is in the composite of matter and form. There is no activity that they have that is outside the composition with matter and form. Now, that's what Aquinas had said he was going to explain in chapter 5, and so now we've reached the end of chapter 5. This account is, of course, already far too long, and so I'm going to stop here, and then maybe perhaps another time come back and uh, complete this lecture with a discussion on De Ante Essentia. But for our purposes, we've already had much more than, uh, than I think we require, and I think this will lead to a rather vivid dis uh, discussion on Thursday. Thanks very much.